how many of you remember watching video before there was Netflix? Okay. Well, Netflix probably was the, one of the largest or most instrumental in, in the driving the adoption of adaptive bitrate streaming because they embraced it very early on, right around the same time that a company called Move Networks did, right before Microsoft came out with smooth streaming technology. And what it allowed you to do was not have just a single stream sent out, and if you're lucky, you had enough bandwidth to watch it, and if you were unlucky, it buffered and you got the pause, 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 or... Uh, you e either that or you got relegated to the lowest common denominator bit rate and you had to watch really fuzzy video because that's what somebody would send out to make sure that your video didn't stall because you didn't have enough bandwidth. Well, adaptive bit rate re allows you to have multiple bit rates. That's what's represented here. Let me, let me back it up a little bit. Here's sort of a generic workflow today for an adaptive bit rate streaming workflow. Uh, this one assumes you're doing it live and it starts with the camera over on the left and this is simplified, obviously. Camera going into an encoder. That sends a single stream into a transcoder. And there are different ways you can do this. So this isn't uh, the, the end all be all. But a transcoder then takes that first single stream and then breaks it up into multiple streams at different quality levels, different resolutions, different bit rates. Pushes those into a server, which can store a copy of everything for on-demand use later. It will push it out to a bunch of edge servers, sometimes a content delivery network. You may have heard of Akamai or Limelight or Level 3. Uh, and then that, those edge servers will deliver it typically globally, that content, and possibly in multiple formats. This is MPEG Dash. RTMP was the, the Flash flavor for many years, still, has, still is, although Flash is waning fast. Smooth streaming, the first adaptive uh, bitrate streaming that was commoditized in the market followed soon thereafter by HLS from Apple. That's how we watch almost everything on these devices today because Apple said, if you're gonna have a video application on iTunes, it's gotta support HLS, which is HTTP live streaming. And then these older forms like RTSP, which real networks used and QuickTime used and Windows Media in the early days. And even older for old set-top boxes, MPEG-TS. So you can have a single infrastructure like this that can deliver all these different formats, meaning that no matter what device a person is using, they can receive your content, if you're a content producer, and watch that content. And what you see, though, is these multiple streams coming out each represent a different quality level. That could be three quality levels. Some uh, Netflix in early days uh, was delivering out about 12 different quality levels to make sure that even as your bandwidth maybe got a little worse or maybe you're on a wireless device and you go behind a post and suddenly your Wi-Fi drops off, your video would keep playing. It would just degrade a little in quality very, very uh, in a seamless way so you, couldn't, you almost couldn't tell and then it would you know, get a little fuzzy and then it would snap back up as soon as you had additional bandwidth or if your computer was doing something else as soon as your computer freed up uh, processing power. So that's sort of a standard generic workflow for adaptive bitrate streaming. Today you'll see, and you may see this in the room somewhere, that the camera and the encoder can sometimes be combined on the same device. And so that makes it even easier if you're going mobile. You don't need a separate encoder necessarily strapped to your camera. Or if you do, it may be just a small little backpack, uh, not, not even a backpack, more like an Apple TV sized device that mounts right on the camera. And then a lot of these things that used to be on premises can now also be run in the cloud if it's software based or you're using a service. So you can do all sorts of interesting things where some of this is all running within the firewall of the business where you work or the school where you go to school. Or you could run a lot of this stuff in the cloud, which really accelerates your ability to deploy this very quickly without having to wait for a budget to come around and somebody to approve you buying a hardware and somebody to maintain the hardware and install the software. So the different ways you can do all that. But it gets you these really nice ways of launching quickly as a standard service now. You live stream, you got uh, Ustream, Wow's a streaming cloud. YouTube, Facebook, all offer essentially various versions of this to allow you to get streaming very quickly at very high quality. Basically, the highest quality that each of your viewers can watch based on their hardware and their bandwidth is what they get. So you're no longer consolidated or consigned to the lowest common denominator. So uh, let's dive in just real quickly to a couple of things. I, know I showed you that you can roll out content in multiple formats. And what that's called, essentially you're taking, if I go back to that previous picture, you're taking the same content usually. It's usually H.264 video and AAC audio, and you're just re-wrapping it. You're wrapping it in a different package here and pushing it down the pipe. 
And so what that means is you don't have to have the video stored six times. You just have to wrap it correctly and send it down to those devices. So it can save a lot on having to create the content once, but then distribute it in multiple ways. So that's what packaging does. Packaging is simply that idea that you take some stream that's coming in, that's been properly encoded, you put, a, it's like taking a letter and putting it in a different envelope and sending it out with a different envelope. So you may have a whole bunch of copies of the letter and send it out in different envelopes. Essentially, you take the content in, the same video, the same audio, package it differently, send it down along with a manifest. And that's how these players, like your iPhone or your Xbox, know how to play back the content. Because they have a manifest that says, here are all the different streams I have, and here's the different codecs I'm going to use. Conversely, there's something called transcoding. I referred to that earlier. And that's the idea that you're taking content that is coming in in one bit rate or in codec or resolution and transferring it to some other bit rate codec or resolution. Depending on what you're doing, it may be referred to as transrating if you're going from one bit rate to another. Could be, um, could be transcoding if it is actually changing the codecs. It could be transsizing if it's going from one size or resolution to another. But it's all generally referred to these days as transcoding, and it covers all of those. And essentially, it means you're bringing in one stream of some sort. Maybe it's VP8 video and speaks audio, uh, old flash stuff here. And you're bringing it in, and you're transcoding it out. It comes as that H.264 AAC that I was referring to. And now it's in multiple bit rates. And it's split up into little chunks for adaptive bit rate streaming, because adaptive bit rate streaming relies on these chunks to switch. Like every two seconds, let's say, you, if you're your bandwidth drops, it may drop to a lower size chunk, and when it goes up, it goes back up to a, a higher bit rate chunk. So let me show you a little bit how that works. So what I'm showing here is a graph that has time going from left to right and higher bit rate, so higher quality levels going from bottom to top. And so you may start a stream, and you may get this little tiny thing, and what it really does is it sizes it up to the size of your screen, but it may look a little bit fuzzy. And then after two seconds, your player may go, oh, I have more bandwidth. I, I downloaded that first chunk really fast. Therefore, I'm going to download the next size and see how fast that downloads. And maybe you get this next size, the next quality level in the next two seconds. By the third chunk, you're up there at a pretty high quality level, almost 720p now, but just maybe a little bit fuzzy still. And then by the next one, you're up to your highest quality level that you've encoded, which gives you this nice full screen size. Now, maybe your bandwidth drops again for a moment, and it goes back down to this size. And what really happens, again, is your player stretches that out to fit your screen, but it's a little bit fuzzier. And so on. It keeps going up and down, adapting automatically so that you get the best possible quality that you can based on your bandwidth and based on your device's playback capabilities. So how does that work on the player side? Where is that logic happening that makes that happen? There's a player algorithm. This all happens on this. Traditionally, this was server-based, but now it is mostly player-based. There is logic on the player which detects a lot of things. The player will detect every time it downloads one of these chunks how fast it took to download that chunk, how long it thought it was going to take, and whether it thinks there's more room to download a larger chunk if one's available. It also will check the screen size. If you have a really small screen, a low resolution screen, it doesn't make sense to, to download a 4K video and try and play it back on a 720 screen. You're just trying to waste bandwidth, and you're not going to get a great experience. Also, for those of you who are gamers and think about things in terms of frames per second, the player is also monitoring how many frames per second this video will play back at. Normally in the US, it's 30 frames per second. If it sees that your computer is struggling and is only playing back at 25 frames per second, it will assume your computer does not have enough processing power, and it will back it off one quality level to play it back. It also looks, the player also will look for things like dropped frames, how large the buffer is when it's downloading, how much content is left, how fast is it filling the buffer. And then also, if you continue to have problems, if for some reason you're in a bad network situation and the bandwidth keeps dropping and it keeps going up and down, rather than have you go up and down each time, it may factor that logic in and go, oh, look, that every other uh, packet that the person's downloaded has dropped uh, to a lower bit rate. Therefore, I'm just going to keep it low for a while and see if the network stabilizes and then bump it back up. So there's a lot of smartness going on there behind the player switching. <coughs> 